to our wonderful host, Foster Hirsch. We're hey, on. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just get Jim in my view here. And he's the only one I want to see. Where's Jim? I love this. I'm like a floating head. Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay, Jim. I want actually, I want to start um, a Magda Center, the book that you published quite a number of years ago now. Right. Lucy in the Afternoon. Yep. And I, I read it with great interest. But I have to say, um, and it was something I felt when I would see her on interviews on when she wasn't playing her character, it was just Lucille Ball. Right. She doesn't seem to me at all funny. She or wasn't. To have, or to have a sense of humor. And she had fact, a sense of humor. She had a great sense of humor. She, she wasn't funny. Was, but she, she herself, funny. and she was the first one, Foster, to say, I am not funny. I can't tell a joke. I don't know. But she knew funny. She and knew she funny. she appreciated funny. And I knew the first day I met her, I could make her laugh. And that solidified our friendship. The fact that I could make her laugh, I was invited back. And I, I, I tried to make her laugh. I, she enjoyed my sense of humor. And, uh, but no, she was not funny of herself. No, not at all. No. And I felt in reading the book, as I felt when I saw her on TV shows, that there was a sadness to her. Yeah, I understand you're saying that. I understand it. There was she, wasn't, she, she wasn't amusing to me. There was a melancholy about her. Melancholy. Yeah. Did you figure out what was at the bottom of that? Where that came from? Or was that just her temperament? No, I, I, I never did. But you're right. I can't put my finger on it. I mean, here is a woman who achieved so much more than any other woman of her time, almost in her field, certainly. Absolutely. She, you know, she was the first major... Uh, she's the first woman to run a major studio. Uh, she made it to the very top, but yet there was that something missing, and I don't know exactly uh -huh. what it was. Uh -huh. it, 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 it came across when she would appear as herself. You know, when she was protected by the character of Lucy, yeah. she was enchanting. We all loved her. The world loved her. But when I would see her on Johnny Carson, let's say, as Lucille Ball, mm. there was a bit of a barrier and a a, 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 I won't say cold, but not particularly charming or ingratiating. It was not Lucy. No. She, Lucy was a character. Yeah. Lucy was not Lucille Ball. She was created. She, she was, was created. created by the writers and played brilliantly. Brilliant. By Lucy. But Absolutely there was, brilliantly. Nothing, she was nothing like her. But yet when we would go out with her, Steve and I would take her out and we would be at places. She was wonderful to the people who would come up to her and say, Miss Ball, could I just tell you? She, yes, but she'd always want to know about them. Where are you from? What do you do? You know, tell me about yourself. Um, so that's the way she always was. I, I remember one afternoon with her. I don't tell this story often because I get a little emotional. <clears throat> it was a Saturday, and I usually didn't see her on Saturday, but at 10 o'clock that morning, she called, and she said, can you come over today? And I said, sure, I, I can be there a half hour. She said, I need you right now. So I went over and she was all by herself in the house, the, the two people, the cook and the, uh, the guy who worked around, Chris and Ruja, a wonderful couple. So uh, I said, what's the matter? She said, there's a boy from the Make-A-Wish Foundation who's coming over to spend an afternoon with me because he loves me and we're gonna watch a couple. Would you just be here with me? I said, of course. And I could see how emotional she was getting. Well, John, his name was, and he arrived in a limo and Lucy greeted them and hugged them. She knew exactly what episodes, uh, you know, that he wanted to see. And we all sat in the den. I kind of sat in the back and the two of them sat up and she held his hand and it was just beautiful. And at the very end of the day, oh, here's the part that gets me. We went to the front door and there was a very long walkway between the door and uh, Roxbury Drive. And uh, some people had gathered, they saw the limo and Lucy opened the door and there was a scattering of applause and she gave John a hug. And he started down the driveway and he came back and he ran into her arms and he said, will you pray for me? And she said, I already have John, you'll be, you'll be fine. And gave him a hug and off he went. And she just dissolved in my arms. And I could see how vulnerable she was. But I think she had been hurt so much over the years 
that she built up a resistance. She built yeah. up a wall. You, you know, uh, that, that chapter in the book is incredibly moving. And what the audience doesn't understand is John was a, a child who was dying. Yeah. And his last wish was, could he meet Lucille Ball? Yeah. And she said yes, and she gave him an entire afternoon. Yeah, and what, what was upsetting to her was that he, she thought he was not going to recognize her because he was watching I Love Lucy, and she didn't look like that anymore. And she didn't want him to see an old lady with red hair, and of course it didn't matter, you know. There was there was a one time we were standing out in the uh, uh, in the backyard and I was sitting by the pool and she came in with the dog in her arm and she just looked up into the sun and it was almost like the transfiguration. There was the young Lucille Ball and I mean, it was just amazing. And I know how lucky I was to have been able to spend that time with her. But, just, but what was it. what was the what was the ingredient? You were after all when you before you met her and wrote out and wrote to her. You were a complete stranger to her. Complete. Complete yeah. stranger. You had yeah. no in there at all. And yet she invited you and she took to you and she yeah. kept inviting you back. What yeah. was it about you she responded to? That what made her laugh? <laughs> uh, she, I had written this play called uh, The Lucky O'Leary's and it was about two sisters of a certain age that were in their 60s and they didn't get along and there was sibling rivalry and they wanted to win the lottery. It was a serious play, but there was silly stuff and it was very funny. So I thought, gee, Catherine Hepburn would be fun for this. So I actually sent it to Ms. Hepburn, who I knew a bit, and she said, I would be terrible. I'd be miscast. I think Lucille should play this. I said, do you know how to get in touch with her? No, and that was the end of that. <laughs> I found a Maps to the Stars home and I got her address and put the play in a, uh, a brown envelope. And I said, and I played backgammon and I took a class with you in 1977. I'd love you to read the play and Kate Hepburn thinks you're be wonderful. And a fellow named Merrill Karf, who was a great producer, knew me, knew her. He had produced Stone Pillow. So I think he put that reference in. So I wasn't, I had a bit of a, uh, you know, intro by naming those names. Well, the phone rang two days later, and it was Lucy, and she said, can you come over and talk about it? I did. I made an incredible faux pas. Why, why, why we became friends, I don't know. <clears throat> I sat down opposite her to play backgammon out in the back house, and I broke her chair. I mean, crack. I broke the chair, and it was obvious I broke the chair. And I, I said, well, excuse me, I have to do one thing. I have to show... Somebody is, somebody is curious as to what's going on here, and his name is Leo. So there's Leo the cat. All right, so I shall, I shall continue. So um, I said, Miss Ball, oh, call me Lucy. Well, I said, Lucy, I just broke your chair. She said, well, get another one. I said, well, okay. So I got another one, sat down, and I broke that one too. So now I've broken two chairs in a matter of two minutes. And I said, well, why don't I take that chair? That one looks sturdy. She said, well, the other two look sturdy, too. I said, oh, mother of God. So I got the third one. Now, she tried to tell me a joke that I'm not going to repeat because it is just not fit for mixed company. She screwed it up. And I said something back to her that literally made her fall on the floor laughing. And I knew at that moment we had a relationship. So we spent five hours together, and we talked about everything but the play. And... Um, at the end of the day, she said, can you come back tomorrow? And I said, yes, I can. But if I come back, you have to give me a present. And she said, maybe I'll give you a chair. <laughs> and uh, so the next day I came back and we were playing back. Oh, that day, by the way, I won by one point. So she knew I could also play backgammon against her and, and I could beat her. So I came back the next day and halfway through the game, she started singing, Happy birthday to you. And she brought over this box and it was a little green foil box and I opened it and this was in it. It's a watch with her little face on it. Oh yes, yes. You see? Yes, yes. So that and was in the box. It. That was in a box with a note that said, Dear Jim, I will always have time for you. And from that day, we spent every day together. 
and um, and I found I could make her laugh, and I just I just loved her. I was uh, that, that's a wonderful story to dine out on. That <laughs> you made Lucille Ball the fun, supposedly the funniest woman in the world laugh, and she yeah. was able to laugh, yeah. and you were able to make her laugh. So. That's yeah, great, and then uh, I would bring friends over. Steve would come over, and she vi invited us down to um, Palm Beach for Thanksgiving. And uh, I, I just loved spending every minute with her. And then, you know, the, the very first day that I saw her was during Wildcat. <laughs> and uh, I begged my father to take me to see Wildcat. He did. I waited around for an autograph. There she was on the stage. I ran down with my playbill. I said, Miss Ball, can I have your autograph? And she said, oh, sorry, no autographs today. And then 1977, 17 years later, I took this six-week comedy class with her. And at the end of the class, I had that playbill. And I was going to ask her for her autograph on the playbill. And I got two away from her. And sure enough, bang. She was out of there. <laughs> Gary Morton came and took her away. She speaks she very negatively about uh, Wildcat in the book. She, she does. She, well, there, let me just. She didn't like it, apparently. Well, let me just finish this. So yeah. let me just say, a few days before she died, she got a shipment of eight by 10 glossies of her, um, from the 1940s. It was a glamour shot. And she said, do you have one of these? And I said, no. And she said, well, pick it up when you leave. Well, I, I put it in an envelope and I didn't look at it until the next day when she'd gone to the hospital and it said, dear Jim, you're very special. Love Lucy. And I realized at that time, after 30 years, I had gotten her last autograph. Um, so that's that was the, la the last. So that's the end of the autograph story. But I, I, you, op you open the book with her talking very critically about Wildcat. Yeah. Which role was a legendary appearance. Uh, apparently, uh, you, you saw it, but I've heard when she would make her entrance, the audience was so thrilled to, su to see Lucy on stage. Yeah. That wouldn't stop applauding. She had to get out of character and acknowledge the applause before they would let her go on with the show. I, I don't remember that, but it's, it's certainly possible. I mean, she was beloved. I mean, so beloved. And I was thrilled to, to see her. And the show I thought was terrific, you know? It was only she didn't. She didn't think it was terrific. No, and it wasn't. It really <laughs> wasn't terrific. And she had a lot of problems, you know? Uh, she was doing eight shows a week. She wasn't well, and... Uh, she, I think she bit off more than she could chew. And she wanted to start a Broadway show and she didn't realize just how damn difficult it is to do eight shows a week. She closed it before it had to close because it was doing good business. Yeah. She closed it. I want to move on. You were very good at meeting and greeting and maintaining friendships with famous people. Didn't you become very uh, close to Ethel Merman and then you did a play about her? I did. Yes. I did. Well, I, met, I went Ethel when I was 12 years old my father worked with her father, Ed Zimmerman. And so I was going to be a priest up until the time I was going to be, well, I, up until the time I was 12, I was going to be a priest. In fact, I knew I was going to be the first Brooklyn born Pope. And uh, when other kids were practicing baseball, I was practicing how I would come out onto the balcony of St. Peter's and, and bless the crowd and, and do all that. Then on June 20th, 1959, my father got Ethel Merman's house seats for Gypsy, E101, 102, at the Broadway <laughs> Theater on 53rd Street. And uh, Ed Zimmerman met us afterwards, and he said, Ethel's waiting for us. And it was truly the first religious experience I ever had in my life. It was so moving. It was electrifying. And I knew I didn't want to be Pope anymore. I wanted to do that. And so uh, we went backstage to meet Ethel. She was still on the stage. The curtain was down. Uh, she knew my father. She said, hiya, Pete. Looked at her father. Hiya, Pop. And you must be Jimmy. And uh, I turned into Ralph Cramden. And uh, what are you going to be when you grow up? And uh, at that minute, the, the curtain of the Broadway theater went up. And I was standing next to Ethel Merman. And I said, I'm going to be a showgirl. Well, no, I mean, I, well, I had the height. So I thought I could be a showgirl. But anyway, that's not true, but the rest of it is true. The rest of it's true. <laughs> and then she and I became friends, and, and she and I worked together. Uh, we worked together in 1980 in a show called Musical Comedy Tonight that was produced and hosted by Sylvia Fine, uh, where four Broadway shows were produced and four eras uh, were recreated. And it was um, 
good news with Sandy Duncan. Anything goes with Merman. Uh, Oklahoma with Carol Burnett and an interview with Agnes DeMille. And then Richard Chamberlain and Carol Burnett in company. So, um, so I remember Ethel getting to the Wilshire Bell Theater. Hiya, Jimmy, little Jimmy Brochu. What in the mother of God, what are you doing here? And I said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have a drink afterwards, okay? Oh, yeah. So Peter Matz was conducting, and it came time for the rehearsal for Anything Goes. And Ethel came out. I was the assistant to the director, Stan Harris, lovely man. He said, uh, she said, what are we doing? He said, this is the Anything Goes number. I don't know that. Don't give me songs I don't know. And we froze, cause she wasn't kidding. And Stan said, take her to the dressing room and uh, tell her we have a technical thing. See if she wants to lie down or... So I, I said, there's a technical problem. Let me take you back to the dressing room. And I took her back. And uh, about 20 minutes later, uh, I went and got her and she said, are you ready? <clears throat> I said, everybody's ready. And okay, let's do it. And the, uh, that clip is on YouTube. You can go really? look at it. Yes. Uh, musical comedy tonight of her doing Anything Goes. And she does it brilliantly. And then afterwards, I said to her, um, Ethel, do you want to go out for that drink? And she said, oh, honey, you know, I, I don't think so. Can we do it some other time? And, and I said, uh, yeah. I said, do you remember that day that your dad brought me backstage to meet you after Gypsy? And she said, honey, I don't remember yesterday. And what, what had happened was, we think it was a mini stroke. Uh, and it was the beginning of the brain tumor that eventually took her life. So um, that was Merman, and I, I, I just loved her. She but tell, was, us about, tell us about the play, which I didn't see, The Big Voice, God, or Merman, which speaks to the issues you've just been talking about of religion and theater, which is your religion in a way, I guess. <laughs> well, it, it absolutely is. And religion and show business are very, very much alike. You know, they, they are, um, they're both the same. Uh, you know, I was attracted to the church. I, I started to realize later that I was attracted to the costumes, the scenery, the makeup, the props, you know, the vestments, the choir, the music, the lights. It, it was a show. And it wasn't until I saw a real show that I, I knew what I wanted a real show to be about. So actually, Steve and I wrote a, a musical called The Last Session. And uh, it was a big hit for a, uh, a theater in LA called the Laguna Playhouse. And uh, won a bunch of awards. But anyway, the producer of the Laguna Playhouse said, look, we're doing a series of one-nighters of one-person shows, but we have Susan Egan and Charles Nelson Riley, and we want you and Steve to be the third, you know. I said, well, what would we do? He said, tell a couple of stories sing a couple of songs, and that's how Big Voice was born, because I can't improvise. I, I had to write this out. So we went down to do one performance, and the place came apart. And we knew we had something here, so we, we sat down and we workshopped it, and we did a, a production of it in Los Angeles, <clears throat> and we were nominated for Best Musical by the Ovation Awards, which is the LA equivalent of the Tony. And we were up against this million dollar production of Endgame. And they said, look, our, you know, our production of Big Voice was a desk, a piano, and two chairs, and a cape. And pretty much that was the production value of this show. So it got to the, it got to the ovations that night. And, and now to present the musical, uh, now to present the award for best musical, please welcome Mr. Jerry Herman. As soon as he came out, I knew we had won. And sure enough, we won the ovation that night for Best Musical. And then we came to New York and we opened the 47th Street Theater, which uh, luckily is on 47th Street. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we ran there for six months. In fact, the show was so successful that Steve and I were succeeded by two guys playing us. <laughs> so yeah, we had other commitments. We had to leave and, uh, and so that was that. But you're, you, have, you sort of specialize in one-person shows. I guess you're- well, Nobody else will hire me. Well, that, <laughs> but I guess you're most known for Zero. You've done, you, you did it in New York, you did it on tour, you did it a lot. I did it, I did about 800 performances of it. You became, you became Zero Mostel. Yeah, it was fun uh, to be him. How did you, did you know him? I did. 
I did. I knew Davy Burns. Davy Burns was my mentor who was in Forum. And through Davy and Forum, I met uh, Zero, who always scared the hell out of me. Uh, I, I went to a uh, prep school. It was a military school. And uh, so I wore this uh, West Point type uniform. And so uh, I would come to visit Davy at the Alvin Theater. And one night I remember running into Zero in my uniform and he was just covered in sweat. And he looked at me and he said, who are you, General Nuisance? And he, he just scared me. And I said, hey, what are you doing here? I said, well, I came to see my friend Davy Burns. Well, you never come to see me. I said, well, I, I, I will, I, if I will, you better. <laughs> and so I would start to visit Zero and um, hang out with Davy and meet Jack Guilford. And these, these guys became my, you know, godfathers. Um, they really took me under. In fact, we were watching old Vic Dan, Dick Van Dyke last night, and another one of my godfathers popped up on that, Lou Jacoby. <clears throat> How I loved my Lou Jacoby, <clears throat> and Jack Albertson and Hans Conried. <clears throat> Those that's, guys. That's quite a collection. They but were you, my choir. Yeah, and you, you know, you I wrote, loved, boy, how I love Zero. Jim, that? You, you wrote Zero Hour. I did. Well, it's performing it. So it's I your did. concept. And then how did you get the wonderful Piper Laurie to become your director? How did that happen? Well, Piper is my, Rosie is my friend. And uh, when I first wrote the play, she said, well, you know, I knew Zero. So I, I said, well, you got to tell me. And she told me some stories about him, about his craziness. So I said, well, look, I'm doing a, a reading. So she came to the reading and she was just marvelous with, uh, some ideas she had, some editing, some new things to put in. We did another reading together. And finally, I said to her, you know, when we were going to New York, I said, I think you should take credit as director. You've done enough uh, to do this. And uh, she said, okay. And then we really started to work on it. And we went to Washington uh, just before New York and uh, cleaned up the play. And, um, and that's how she did it. She's, she's just the best. I am crazy about her. Oh, she's, she's one of a kind. She's a great actress, but- well, I she, met her, I met you through her as a matter indeed, of- Indeed, yeah, indeed. But she's not only herself a great actress, but she's very intuitive and perceptive yes. about the work of other actors, which isn't often the case. Yes. She is, she's a good student of yes. other actors. Yeah, in fact, we only disagreed about one line for the whole thing, and, uh, and I won. Now, you played Zero Mostel. Yes. You, you played Davy Burns. You played Tevya in Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> you played with Theodore Bikel in Sunshine Boys. Yes. And I hate to tell you, Jim, but uh -oh. you're not Jewish. <laughs> you're not Jewish. I'm, you I'm have all these Jewish parts. <laughs> I was the Shabbos Goy. You know, and believe me, to have those godfathers, I had to be part Jew. You must have, it must have rubbed off. <laughs> Absolutely rubbed off. I was the Shabbos goy for the, the Gersteins. You know, um, it's, it's, I'm a Jew in my heart. What can, what can I tell you? You know, anybody from Brooklyn is a Jew in their heart, right? From, from Brooklyn of that era. Of, of that, that era, era. Of, yeah. Of that era, of that yeah. era. Was, yeah, was I, there, probably, I probably know more Yiddish than any other Catholic boy around. Was there a connection between David Burns and Zero Mostel in terms of their public affect or what they were like off stage? Did you find there, there were similarities in, in your approach to them and who they were? Well, I never spent, uh, I never spent time with Zero off stage. Uh, I, I, I had one encounter with him. You know, I'd see him from time to time, but it was never like, let's have dinner or, or something like that. Davy, I spent an enormous amount of time with, uh, off stage and uh, uh, on. I, I mean, not not on stage with him, but uh, you know, I was around him much more than uh, than Zero. Zero, you know, they were both individuals who weren't afraid of being themselves. Davy was absolutely crazy. Uh, if he had pulled some of the stuff today that he had pulled back in the '60s and '50s, he'd be in jail. He he was a groper. He was very sexual. He used sex as humor. As Sandra Lee once told me, you prayed that there was no hole in the scenery. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but they were both out there and they were both themselves. And, and they'd be hard pressed today, wouldn't they? It wouldn't work. 
They were. I, and I mean, Davey was both, he was like Zero, who could give a musical comedy performance, but also could give an incredible dramatic performance. He was, you know, he was the original furniture dealer in The Price. And he took ill just before opening night. And I saw him in that. His, his him. understudy took over. And um, back in June of 69, he was going back into the show, June of 68. And um, he was very nervous about going back in. And so I drove him out to the country where he had a, a farm and uh, he wanted me to stay over. So, and I know Toddy, his wife was in some place. So anyway, he said, will you cue me? And I'll never forget that night, Foster, that I played the cop and he played the furniture dealer. And I ran lines with Davy Burns doing the price, you know? And I got to hang out at a lot of the rehearsals and see the tension that went on in putting that play together. I was kind of a little mouse in the corner, but I would watch Arthur Miller and Ulu Grosbard go at it. And uh, Grosbard was directing and he would tell Jack Warden, who was playing the cop, you know, do it this way. And then five minutes later, Arthur Miller would go up to him and say, well, I got to the rehearsal one day and all of a sudden Pat Hingle was playing the part. It wasn't Jack Warden anymore. And it looked like he had been up in the part for a couple of days. So, um, and it was funny, I went to Philadelphia to see the first uh, preview of it at the Walnut Street Theater. Here I am, a little pisher, a little pisher. I'm a nobody. And Arthur Miller comes up to me and says, so what do you think? <laughs> what do I know? I said, it's wonderful, Mr. Miller, it's just wonderful. But you know, at the time I saw that original production, it was not greeted as a great play was over not. the years over yes. the years the reputation has grown and grown and grown and yeah. now it's considered one of his greatest achievements very much so that's not how it was received on its first production it was, it was, and it was really quite brilliant really it was, was brilliant, brilliant but it, it somehow didn't get the favor of the critics at that yeah, time you're right you're absolutely right what was it like being with uh, theodore bikel i knew him a little uh, bit uh, in Sunshine Boys, those are two great parts. He's one of those people that came into my life because of Zero. Uh, he came to see the show early in the run in Los Angeles, as many others did, friends of Zero with their arms crossed, like, show me, you can't do Zero. So I'm coming to see this show to let you know that you're an idiot. Well, <laughs> he wrote me the most wonderful letter after the show. He didn't come back and I was a little sad that he didn't come back. I thought I had displeased him. So uh, he wrote me this note saying, thank you for bringing a volcano we long thought to be extinct back to life. And I wrote back to him and we just became friends. Then we had a mutual friend in Washington at Theater J who said, did you guys ever think about doing Sunshine Boys? And uh, I said, geez, I'd love to do it. So I played Willie and he played Al and it was Total joy to act opposite that man. Total joy. What a classy act he was. A, a real gentleman. Yeah, a mensch. A real gentleman. Yes, as absolutely. We Catholics, as we Catholics say, a mensch. A mensch. Now, you were very successful not that long ago in The Man Who Came to Dinner. No kidding. Do you remember doing that? No. Did you, you see me? If, if you saw me, then I'll have to take credit for it. But yes, I'll take credit for it. <laughs> I had, you know, after, uh, after a I mean, couple aren't of you, weeks, Aren't you made to play Sheridan Whiteside? Isn't that perfect casting for you? Well, I, I thought it was. It's a tough part, Foster. It is a tough part. And I thought I could just walk in and, and put that part, you know, over my shoulders and sail with it. It's tough. And we, I don't think we had enough rehearsal. The first week, I was very shaky. If you saw the show in the third week, I think it was the definitive production. But, but it the took first you a week while. when all the critics, and, and uh, I got by with a lot of the critics, uh, except for the girl from the Times. Um, and, and I think she was right to an extent. But had she held off and seen the show in the third week, uh, the reviews would have been very different. It, I was blessed with the most wonderful company. Uh, dear Joe Sakari as banjo. And you know, Davey was the original banjo. And uh, I had the blessing of Ann Kaufman and, uh, and uh, Chris Hart, you know, who were at the first rehearsals. And um, 
it, it, it was just a great experience. And it was a part I always wanted to play. I, I, but it's, I, it's, it's tailor it's, made for Jim Brochu. It's fucking Hamlet. It's Hamlet. <laughs> Now you're you're also, of course, we started out talking about your being a writer, but you've written a lot of plays and they've gotten done in regional theaters and abroad. Cooking with Gus is your first title. And that became very that became a sort of I I, I wonder if I can say it, a dinner theater staple. Cooking no, I wrote it for dinner theater. You wrote I it for dinner theater. I absolutely wrote it for dinner theater. I was working at a place called the Waldo Astoria in Kansas City. It was a, probably their biggest dinner theater. And I was doing Fiddler, I was playing Tevye. And um, I said, what's the next play? He told me, I said, oh, that's a terrible play. He said, it took that man two years to write that play. <coughs> I said, I can write your bad play in a week. <laughs> so I bet him I could write a bad play in a week. It was called Cooking with Gus. I sent it to Samuel French. They published it and it has been done to death. It's, it's been done all over the country. It's like The Odd Couple in Canada. It was taped for French television. It's, and it, it's really nonsense, but, uh, you know. Is it, is it a bad play? Yeah. It's bad. But no, it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's four, listen, it's four characters, one set, no plot. It's perfect for dinner <laughs> theater. <laughs> Have you ever performed in it? No, 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 I didn't write it for myself. You did <laughs> No, I wouldn't be in it if you paid me. Okay. Now, you, you, we were talking before, Jim. You're, you've been a, a regular on uh, cruise ships. <clears throat> yes. A regular. And, for, the last, uh, for the last 25 years, yeah. Really? And you have a number of, of programs you do, a number of themes that you, that you talk about. Do you like doing cruise ships? It's a tough job. I've lectured on cruise ships. I find it's very hard. You don't know who you're talking to. Gee, I, I find it to be so easy. I mean, really? they give me a 16 day cruise and I have to work for an hour, two hours and 20 minutes. I mean, that's fine. And most of the, most of the uh, lectures I do, I do one on Kate Hepburn. I do one on Jimmy Cagney, one on Lucy. Um, one on RKO, which I've Oh, I did the RKO story, yes. yeah, which is fascinating. Yes. Yes. Um, so I have about six or seven that I talk to the cruise director <coughs> and I ask him what he wants me to do. Uh, once in a while, I'll do character man on the ship. Um, but yeah, I started with, uh, it's funny how these things happen. I met Steve on a cruise ship in 1985. And there was a couple on board who stayed with the ships became cruise director and social hostess. And so about 1995, he said, you've written this book, you can come out and now be a, a lecturer. I said, great. So we took this three week cruise to uh, Asia on the Marco Polo. The day we got back, I walked into a Ralph's uh, supermarket on Ventura and Vineland in LA. And here I was in aisle eight, jams and jellies. And I'm seeing, <laughs> I see an old friend of mine who uh, was in costumes. He was Charles Pierce's costume designer. He said, well, look at you. I haven't seen you in years. I said, well, yeah, well you're all tan. I said, yeah, I was just lecturing on a cruise ship. What'd you lecture about? I gave him the topics. I said, are you still doing costumes? He said, no, I booked the lecturers for Crystal Cruises. The next day we had tickets on the Crystal Harmony. That was May of 1996. And from then we did about three or four a year. And you're booked to do one in October if, if it's safe to do it? If it's safe to do it, we're booked to do one on October 1st. I, I don't think it's gonna happen. Because yeah, of the I, I, I talked to my friend, the cruise director, and he, he thinks it's kind of iffy. Because and I have been blessed life. to do that. We've been to all seven continents, you know, major cities and, uh, it's been a wonderful life to do the cruise ships. Now, I, what, were you, what, what ship were you on that you didn't Crystal, like it? Crystal. You were? Yes, but I'm saying my, my, my program was different from yours. I was showing films and talking about films. Oh. And if I'm in front of a class or I'm at a film festival, I know who I'm talking to. But I didn't know what kind of references the audience right. had. And I, if I said something that would be too academic or, 
or depend upon a knowledge that they didn't have, it was hard to get adjusted to the audience level and the, the level I of see. Yeah. And, and knowledge. It wasn't an entertainment thing like yours. It was lecturing about movies that, that they'd already seen. I see. So I, it was hard to gauge just the right level. Yeah. I didn't want them to think I was a fuddy-duddy professor, so I had to be careful, you see. <laughs> It, no, I, I got I you. It's difficult. I, I, I'll go back if they if they if they open up. But before we go, I want to ask you about Joan Crawford because she was a particular friend of yours. What do you want to know about Joan? The truth. The truth is, she was a troubled lady and who's been <laughs> lied about ever since she's dead. I I knew Joan since I was twelve years old. Another that was a very eventful twelve year <laughs> twelve year old time. Uh, my father started me off on cruise ships. We took our first cruise in 1960. And the, the, the buzz that went through the ship left here from New York, 30 days to um, Buenos Aires and back. The big buzz was that Joan Crawford was on the ship and my father went ape. My God, Joan Crawford's on the ship. Now here I am 12 years old. I had no idea who Joan Crawford was. So the first day out at sea, there's a little get together where the, uh, the teenagers got together and there was two kids, Cindy and Kathy. They said, do you want to come back to the uh, uh, stateroom and play some games? I went back and there was their mother, Joan. And I thought she was lovely. We spent the afternoon. She thought I was terrific. I got back to the stateroom and I said, pop, I met this beautiful lady. Now my father was a widower. He said, I don't want to meet no widows. I'm not going to get married again. I said, but she's beautiful. I don't care how pretty she is. Well, that night at dinner, we're sitting uh, against the wall at the end of the dining room and some applause starts. And all of a sudden, my father said, there she is. That's Joan Crawford. And the applause swelled and she came right over to the table and said, hello, Jimmy, dear. <laughs> and my father once again turned into Gleason. Hama, hama. She said, and this must be Pete, your dad. I've heard so much about you. Well, they started a three-year affair. Really? It lasted until November of 1963. And it cooled down, but she and I remained very good friends. Uh, I remained friends with the daughter, the, uh, with the, the twins, not with uh, Christina, who is a nutcase. There may have been problems there, but it was never, ever the way Christine uh, Christina, but, but I like I liked your description very concise, and I will, if I may, I'm going to use it uh, in my own work. A troubled lady who has been lied about since her death. Yes, I think so. That that sounds fair and balanced. Is it? That's it. and concise and pithy. Uh, Don't say fair and balanced. No, I know. I realize that takes us some it. other place. I, 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 I realize as soon as I said it. Now, did you work recently with Audra McDonald? I did. I did. Boy, is she a class act. I, walk with, I worked with her and Christine uh, together uh, on The Good Fight. I play one of the judges. And uh, boy, t two pros. They're just beyond wonderful. Yeah, I adore Audra. We were leaving uh, for the day. And I said, God, I wish I knew how to take a selfie so I could have a picture with you. And she said, I know how to do that. So she took the selfie. When was that on, Jim? When was it on? It's on now. Oh, it's on now? Yeah, on The Good Fight, season two. Season two? Are yeah. You, are you still making them or everything's on pause? Not right now. I haven't heard anything. But I play Judge Vernon Windsor, very nice man from the Northeast. Were they, were they planning to do more episodes? I think they were. They were? But yeah, but I don't pause. know. It's on pause. Yeah. Everything is. Everything is. Yeah. Well, we, we, uh, we'll pause, but we, Mark, let's open it to questions from... The audience, I think. All right, let me get my glasses. Okay, uh, I have from Sandy Durrell. Jim, you've had an amazing career, have met the creme de la creme in theater. What is it that you would like to accomplish that you haven't as yet? I, I can't think of a thing, Sandy, except uh, uh, get so fat that your pajama bottoms don't fit anymore. No, I, I really can't think of anything else. I'm good. Then I'll have right. to get you new ones. <laughs> uh, I have from Billy. 
I want to mention Jim's 1959 Flag Court Follies. <laughs> Flag Court is right up 72nd Street in Brooklyn. When Jim lived there, my grandfather had a small apartment in the basement. He was the fire watch. <gasps> oh, my God. The day I saw Merman, I got back to uh, Bay Ridge where we had a theater in our apartment building. And I got all the kids together and I wrote, produced, directed, and starred in the Flat Court Follies of 1959. And we, we raised $359 for cancer. And uh, that started me on the road to perdition. And of course, I gave myself all the best numbers, including an unforgettable Bally High and a startling version of uh, Give My Regards to Broadway, which closed act one. Thank you very much. I see Michael Colby. Hi, Michael. How are you? been a long time. Uh, Leslie Middlebrook uh, was questioning the dinner theater show you were doing when you referenced that. Uh, was it a man who comes to dinner? The dinner show I was doing? Yeah. No, in, uh, in Kansas City, it was Fiddler on the Roof. Okay. Um, I know I have more. Okay. Uh, Alexander Nader, a question. Did you ever- I was playing question? Golda. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander Nader asked, did you ever meet Desney Arnaz? Never. Desney had died by the time I knew Lucy. Okay. Uh, okay. And Leslie Middlebrook again. I'm sorry. I don't know the name of Jim's book. What is it? And is it available on Kindle? Now, before, so, so before, plug the book. <laughs> before we go on, I just want to make sure nobody talks and wakes Frances Hill up. Okay. Because I see Frances is there and she's sound asleep. Oh, hi, Francis. <laughs> hi, honey. You looked like you were asleep. The name of the book is Lucy in the Afternoon, and you can get it on Amazon, I think. You can. And it's, it's, very, it's very good, and it's surprising. You learn things that you, that you don't expect. Oh, it's good. It's surprising. It feels like you know her. It's very intimate. Uh, it's, it's very conversational. And you feel you're in the house playing backgammon or watching you, the two of you play backgammon. There's a oh, very intimate, you. you bring us in. You bring thank us you. In. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, from Margo Astrakhan, what was the last show you did? Hi, Margo. Yeah, well, I was going to open that off-Broadway show on March 12th. Uh, that's why I have this beard. This is my, uh, what am I trying to say, my protest? that I, I stopped shaving the day Broadway closed and I'm not gonna shave until Broadway opens, from which I understand tonight I'm gonna look like Gandalf uh, in a few months. Yeah, we were about to open a show on March 12th, the day it all stopped, called um, A Class Act, uh, which was a wonderful musical uh, about Ed Kleban. And I was gonna play um, Lehman Engel, uh, a conductor, and geez, it was such a talented cast, and it was, it was kind of sad. We had done a dress rehearsal the night before that was spectacular, and we were sold out. The whole run was sold out, so that was sad, but supposedly we're going to open again on February 3rd, you know, Olivai, as, <laughs> as, as the Catholics say. All right, so I'll toss it back to Foster. Okay, Jim. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a play you did with Rue McClanahan. God, yes. Yes. Which wonderful, one? Wonderful actress. You did more than one with her? Fat Chance. Yes, Fat Chance. Uh, yeah, Fat Chance was, um, gee, it's, it's kind of one of my lesser known plays, but it's one of my favorite. And Rue read it and uh, she wanted to do it. And she did it with um, a wonderful cast, Virginia Capers. Uh, the Great Virginia Capers. And it's about a lady who is, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Agoraphobic. And uh, she's an artist and she will not go outside. And uh, it's, how, yeah. it's how her mother and her housekeeper get her to go out. So Rue, Rue just loved the play and she wanted to do it. We did it at the Colony Studio Theater in Los Angeles. Oh, but it sounds like it has, it has a premise that's uh, unfortunately fitting for today. Very much so. I was thinking that. Very fitting for today. Yeah. It's so nice to see everybody. This is good. We couldn't get into a room like this and, and get off without not paying $20 a piece. 
Jim, excuse me, who was the person that you, um, a famous person that you gave the first job to? Oh, okay. Here's Steve, everybody. Look, it's the great Steve. Hey, Steve. Hi, Steve. Hey. I've already heard all these stories. <laughs> Come on. More than once. All right, we go to um, 1970. And uh, there was a place called, a lot of you old timers like me, Diane, you may remember this place, called Club Benet. Yes, the Club Benet Dinner Theater in Morgan, New Jersey. So the show was Bye Bye Birdie, and I was directing. So I see everybody, and in comes this kid, 16 years old, to, for, to audition for Hugo. And he was terrific. Boy, he was great. So I get him to the callback, uh, I give him the job, and he said, good, I can quit high school. I said, if you quit high school, then no, I'm not going to give you the job. He said, okay, we won't quit high school. So the show opened, and I had an agent friend, a manager named Bob Lamont. And Bob was very, very good, had great taste. And I brought him out to see the lead, a friend of mine named Jim Hamill, who was playing the Dick Van Dyke part, who I thought was terrific. So I brought out Davy Burns and Mary Jo Catlett in my little Volkswagen car and, um, and Bob Lamont. The four of us go out to see Jim Hamill. So after the show, I said to Bob, I said, so what do you think of my friend? He said, who was your friend? I said, uh, you know, who played the Dick Van Dyke part? He said, I hardly even noticed him. He said, who's the kid who played Hugo? The 16-year-old. I said, oh, well, he's very good, isn't he? He said, yeah, can he... Uh, can he come see me in the office on Monday? I said, I'll arrange it. So at that point, I sent John Travolta to see him. <laughs> and that was the end of that. And John quit high school, God damn it. Really? Yeah. But he was that good. You just knew it. Brilliant. 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 He had it all, Foster. He walked in. He, he, the, the charisma was dripping off of the kid. And he had blue eyes that would just make you melt into, a, into the ground. No, and he was a darling, he, and he still is a darling. I, I see Johnny uh, from time to time, and he's still one of the nicest human beings that ever lived. So yes. do you think, I think, Jim, do you think that the business is going to come back, or has your business been so hard hit, it's going to be a long time before there's work for people? Well, I think it's going to come back. I don't know if I'm going to be around to see it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of at the tail end of things here. I'm not a kid starting out anymore. Um, so I don't know. I've, I've, um, uh, I, I've, been a, I've had a great career. Uh, there ain't much more I could do. You know, I always wanted to stop a Broadway show. Did that. Always wanted to write a book. Did that. You know, if you... If uh, always wanted to fuck Richard Chamberlain, so if that's around, you know, you can give me a call. <laughs> Anything I, else? It's I, so I, funny. I feel like I'm in a deaf mute show because all, all I see is people applauding and doing. This. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question from Sarah Ann Rogers. Uh, do you have a favorite role? or a favorite actor or actress? Oh, well, I love playing Tevya. Jesus, Tevya is such a great part. Such a great part. And, um, you know, Kate Hepburn, she just does it for me. She always has done it for me. I love her as an actress, so she may be my favorite. And from Leslie Middlebrook, she wanted to know about how Lucille Ball was as a teacher and what was the class that you took with her? Hi, Leslie. Uh, it was at the Sherwood Oaks Experimental College in 1977. And there was a group of about 100 of us. And she act it was the first time she actually did a class. And then eventually she did these all over the countries, these seminars. And it was six weeks. And you had to come with a question you, or a set of questions. She just did not teach. And, and so people came armed with questions. Some were silly, some were, oh, did Vivian and Bill really hate each other? And, and some were really good questions about the art of acting and producing and, and writing. And she was very patient with everybody. And she would sit in a director's chair in the front of the class. And um, I, rem I remember the first class, and in fact, somebody gave me a tape of these. The first class, I get into a fight with her about all in the family. 
how she thinks that show shouldn't be on the air because those words should never be used. And it was my point that by using these words, we diffuse the power that they have, but she would, she would have none of it. So the very first class, she and I got into a fight. Yeah. Okay, I've got, uh, did you know Shelly Winters? Ah, I didn't know Shelly Winters. No, I, I didn't know her at all. <laughs> but I used to go, Jack Albertson's mother-in-law, Jack Albertson's wife, Wally, who was one of the heads of the Democratic uh, National Committee in, in uh, California. Her mother was a psychic who used to have this Monday night thing in her garage. And the garage was converted into this like seance meditation room. And she had this, she had this huge fish tank at the beginning. And Margo would sit in this chair. Margo had a goiter, so she looked very, very fat. This is Wally's mother. Now, Shelly would come early and, and pick out a seat, and she was there all the time. So this one night she goes and she picks out a seat, but she went out for a cigarette or something. So Margo starts the, Margo starts the thing and somebody else comes in and sits down. And she says, let's be still. And all you hear is the fish tank. Blip, 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 blip. And then you hear, ah, I'm sitting there. Somebody took my seat. Who took my seat? <laughs> So the meditation went up to, up to hell. <laughs> yes, that was my only encounter with uh, Miss Winters. Uh, but I saw her in Minnie's Boys, and I didn't think she was that bad. Did you ever perform with Hepburn? No, I never did. But I got to spend an evening with Kate. I did. At her house in Fenwick. Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah, she was wonderful. It was, uh, she came to see me in a show called Something's Afoot uh, at the Goodspeed Opera House. And, uh, and she lived about 20 minutes from there. So her brother Dick drove us down. She said, I've made blueberry bread. So would you come down and have some? And we went down. And to walk into that house, which was just filled with the ghosts of Howard Hughes and Spencer Tracy and all these incredible people. And uh, just to be there and... Uh, she had these um, hooks attached to um, some of the lamps that just hung about a sixteenth of an inch off of the top of the table surface. And I, I said, Kate, what is this for? And she knocked it aside. And she says, it saves so much time and time is all we have, isn't it? And I'll never forget that. Time is all we have, isn't it? Dear Kate, she died on this day. Did you know that? She died on this day, 17 years ago, June 29th. On this day, no, she on was 96, day, 96 29th. years old. Yeah, and today was the birthday of a very dear friend of mine named Ruth Warwick. Oh, Ruth I knew Ruth her too. Warwick? Yeah. I knew her, yes, Citizen Ruth was, Kane. Ruth was a very dear friend. She was June 29th, yeah. Yeah, but Hepburn passed away, and Kate Hepburn, uh, um, Catherine Houghton, uh, told me that Kate loved the fireplace. I mean, the night I was with her was August, and it was a sweltering hot night, and yet there was a fireplace in every <laughs> room. And she said it was, uh, Kate's death was a little sad because the thing she loved so much was a fireplace, and because she was on oxygen, there couldn't be any fire in the room. So she died sadly. 97, I think she was. Great life. Do you have... Uh uh, Mud to ask, you were showing us before, we, we should end with that wonderful photo you have of Lucy by the pool, which was her favorite, but it, it is was, a beauty. This was Lucy's favorite picture of her. It was taken by Aaron Spelling's pool. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. That's a, that's a great photo. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that's just it's yeah. terrific. Jim, just do you I have the see. photo of, um, of uh, Crawford? And can you tell my favorite story about how she poses for a picture? How she posed for a picture? Well, she always said to me, she said, when you, um, let me see if I can find it on my phone. Uh, she said, when you have your picture taken, always look up and to the right. And I don't know why, but she said, always look up and to the right. Let's see. Crawford Animal Hospital, that's not it.
Talk among yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, this is, I don't know if you can see this picture. Okay, wait now. Wait, 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 I've lost it. I've lost it. Yeah. There's Joan in the middle there. And she's wow. looking up and to the right. And that's me in the coat. And that's my dad there. This is like their engagement kind of thing. But the, the, other, the other thing she told me is when you have your picture taken in a group, always stand on the right. Now, why is that? Answers, answers, <clears throat> because when it's printed in the newspaper, your name comes first. <laughs> Smart, yes. Leave Good it to advice. a great star. Good advice. That's why she was the star she was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think, uh, Mark, I think this is time to say good night. I think it's been a wonderful time, Jim. Thank you for your thank story. You, and your thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. I loved it. Thank I loved seeing all of you. Great Thank going, you. Jim. We loved it. We Absolutely. love you. It was great to see all of you. Truly great Thank seeing you. all of you. Enthralling. Thank you're enthralling. I am Thank enthralling. You so Thank much. you. Yes, you are. Yes. I love your exciting story. Let's enthrall <laughs> each other, shall we? Yes. I loved it. Thank you. And, and, and thank you. Uh, all fascinating. fascinating. Let's all go smoke oh, a God. joint. Jim. <laughs> uh, thank you also to very, Foster. Very, I hope all of you will come back to our other, we have some great lineups coming up. So please. And great. Come. And thanks hey, again to great Foster. Going, Magda. Thank you, Mark. Magda. Thank you for bringing everyone. And thanks Jim, thank you so much, Magda, for getting Bye. these wonderful people. What a wonderful evening. And thank thanks again to Foster for running the interview. Thank you, thanks, Foster. Foster. Thank you, Foster. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Foster. Foster. And it was good. Very good, good, good interview. interview. Thank you very, very much. Good interview. Really, Thank really you. interesting. And Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Have a great Bye. night at the lambs. Yeah, it was. Come out, come all enjoy the lambs. Perfect. Okay. Well, for okay, those Mark. who are who don't familiar with the lambs, it is the oldest theater organization in the country, founded in 1874. It was Lambs who founded things such as the Actors Fund, ASCAP, Actors Equity, United Artists, Paramount Pictures, the list goes on. You can see a history on our website, which is thelambs.org, and that's hyphenated, the-lambs.org. Uh, membership is by invitation, and we are one of the lowest priced private clubs in New York City. And uh, we hope to be uh, starting a partial open in a few weeks where the dining on the terrace will be open for members. Oh, nice. uh, so you can always follow us through the website. You'll find us on all social media as the Lambs Inc., not the Lambs Club, because that's the restaurant that stole our name. Oh. <laughs> yep. thank well, thank you. you all again. You'll see this up on the website sometime tomorrow. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Foster. Thank Bye. you, Magda. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.